Women Taking the Lead, episode 148. Oh, yeah. Everything's about keep optimizing in my world. I actually now have, uh, which was my summer project last year, I, I, I indulge in cross-stitch in my spare time. I design cross-stitch samplers and then make them up. And I've got one at the, on my stairs now. Every day I walk down the stairs, it's got keep optimizing across the top of this picture of lots of other key things to remind me about things in my life. So yeah, everything is about optimization. Hello, my name is Jody Flynn and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. Head over to womentakingthelead.com to join the community and get the resources to support you on your leadership journey. Now, your future awaits. So let's get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm here with a guest I have previously had on. Last August, in episode 45, we got to hear from Chloe Thomas, who is also the host of a podcast, The E-Commerce Master Plan. Um, And I'm really excited to have her back today because she has released another book. Um, And I'm just going to read her bio and then we're going to get into talking to Chloe. But something you should know about her is everything Chloe Thomas does is focused on e-commerce strategy and marketing. She's the author of four books. She has a latest book, but she had three previous. And she's also the speaker and, like I said, the host of the e-commerce master plan podcast. Her latest best-selling book is Customer Manipulation, How to Influence Your Customers to Buy More and why and ethical approach will always win. I love your title, Chloe, because it's both provocative and reassuring. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Julia. It is kind of like the longest subtitle of a book in history, I think. (laughs) (laughs) But I think it's important, especially when you have a title called customer manipulation, right? It can send the wrong message. So you did follow up nicely to explain what it's all about. And before we get any further, I don't know if you were going to say anything on this. I wanted to make it clear so everyone understands we're all manipulators. <laughs> we all do and say things that will entice people to do what we want them to do. You know, so this isn't about how to be skeevy in business, you know, how, how to, you know, really get people to do things they don't want to do. This is really about how to support your customers. But Chloe, I'm going to hand it back to you because you can best explain the approach and the mindset you took when writing this book. Oh, that's you. You gave it such such a good, a good explanation. And it, because it's really important to say that, in, as far as I'm concerned, manipulation is just using really clever kind of neuromarketing tactics um, and the kind of the marketing tactics we all do to, to encourage people to do things, basically. Mm-hmm. And of course, in this day and age where there's so much noise and so much social media and it's so easy to get found out, I suppose, um, we, we have to do that ethically. Because if you if you go about manipulating people to do things that aren't a good idea for them, then you'll quite quickly get found out and your business will quite quickly implode or explode, one or the other, neither of which right. are good. So it's about, it's really, um, the reason we get I gave it this title is it's really kind of a rallying call to say that if you want to serve your customers as best as you can and therefore grow your business as well as you can, you've got to embrace the fact that as marketers, we are manipulators. By putting buy now in a box, in a button and getting, you know, to encourage people to press it, that is a a simple type of manipulation. You know, if we're split testing landing pages, that is manipulation. So we need to embrace this factor. Then we can get on with learning all the tips and tricks and really make our marketing kind of supercharged so that we can help the customers get the products and the services that they need, make our businesses better and make our businesses look after our customers better. Mm -hmm. And this is something we even learned as children, right? We picked up quickly, like, when were the best times to ask mom and dad for a treat? You know, you didn't ask it when they were angry or cranky or tired. You waited till they were in a good mood and you went, hey, you know, so that's kind of the same spirit of this. Like it's it's about approaching your audience um, in a in a respectful way of finding out when is it best for them? you know, for you to approach them. Yeah, com- completely. It's, you know, it's simple things like uh, if you, if you go into a retail store, so into the mall to buy a suit or something, and you're planning on buying a suit and a shirt uh, and maybe a tie as well, the, the salesperson, if they're any good, is going to start off by showing you 
the suit, the most expensive of the three items that you tell them that you want to buy. Because in comparison to the suit, any any shirt is going to seem keenly priced. So mm-hmm. they can probably sell you a more premium shirt because in comparison to the price of the suit, it still seems cheaper than if you went in just to buy, buy a shirt where you probably buy maybe $20 less shirt. So it's it's really simple stuff like that. And it's it's things which we all do as humans. And, and as you can imagine, around the creation of this book, I've done an awful lot of reading into neuromarketing. I am not a neuromarketing guru. I don't have a psychology degree, but I like you know, read it. There's some amazing books out there written by the guys with the PhDs who've done, you know, who've looked into the, into the science behind it all to give us really great tips and tactics. And I I find just that stuff fascinating of how we can, how we can use how humans are kind of hardwired to elicit actions and Mm -hmm. encourage actions. And, you know, we need the people like you to write the books, right? Because there are PhD big brain people who are discovering these Mm. things and writing about them. But typically they're in language that it's hard for um, an everyday person to understand. But you you having a a, a keen interest in that area and having a foot in the marketing world as well, you can translate it. And this was something we were chatting about quickly before Mm. we hit record is I having read your book, how readable it was. And even the things that I didn't have prior knowledge of before, or there areas that I don't necessarily, my business doesn't um, live in yet. Um, I was fascinated with how you were writing about it and how you explained everything and approached it that I felt smarter having (laughs) read your book (laughs) that I now have a better understanding of of e-commerce and how you approach it. And, you know, it's good to say also um, to put it in perspective, although these things definitely apply, like you talked about in the retail store, your area of focus is e-commerce. So it's online businesses, um, those those websites that have shopping carts and, and how to do that. But for those of you listening, even if you don't have an online business, you can definitely apply these approaches to everyday life as well. And that's kind of why I was fascinated to bring you on, um, because I feel like what you're doing is very translatable. But for the sake of our conversation, and so people understand what, what you do, we're focusing on the online world. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, kind of a couple of things to pick up on that. First of all, um, you kind of got the, the crazy professor PhDs who write their really, really clever books that are really hard to read. Then you've got the ones who start transferring it into usable uh, usable ideas, which tend to be kind of the 100 things you can do with this or 100 things you can do with that. Which like It's a little bit like a maelstrom of ideas just hitting your brain, which which can you know lead to procrastination and, uh, and not really getting anything done. So what I've done, tried to do with the book is to take it kind of a level below that and go – Here's how to. Here's a model via which you can work out where you should focus, and then here's some ideas on how to improve that part of your business. So it's there are neuromarketing bits and pieces in there, but really it's it's kind of flipping it and coming at it from the other side of how do you make your business better, and here's some things you can apply at each point. And it's whilst obviously my my um, my skills and my knowledge are in the e-commerce sector, the online retail sector. Um, I, I run a business that isn't an online retail business, so I'm, ah. I'm pretty familiar with the B2B and the, the coaching and the consulting world as well. Yes. And a lot of that learning has fed into this book as well. So I have I know of several people, myself included, who are using the model of customer manipulation to grow their non be, uh, you know, business to consumer e-commerce businesses as well. So it it was my intention to try and write a book that was applicable to businesses, not just in the e-commerce space, although all the examples are, are e-commerce examples. I love that. Great. So we'll, we'll get both sides of the spectrum on this <laughs> as well. And Chloe, your book um, breaks down, it's basically a, a model that breaks down the customer experience into five different phases. Uh, you call them the five stages of the customer master plan. Yeah. Could you give us an overview and then kind of like break down like what each f- stage looks like? Of course. Um, so if you can imagine six circles going from the left-hand side of the page to the right-hand side of the page, um, those are the six customer relationship levels. So they're groups of customers who have a level of relationship with your business. On the left-hand side, we've got the world, which is literally every single human being on the planet. 
So they have almost no relationship with your business at all. They might have heard of you. They might not have heard of you. And um, the next circle in is then visitors, which is people who've actually been to your physical website. Then we have inquirers, who are people who've given you their email address. Then we go on to the first time buyers. This is our fourth circle, who are people who bought from you once. Repeat buyers are then people who've bought from you more than once. And then regular buyers are people who've bought from you lots and lots and lots and lots. They're kind of your advocates who go about getting other people to buy from you and telling you loads of good stuff about your products, products and your business. So there's six, those six circles. And the book then is divided into five chapters, which are the five stages for getting people from one circle to the next. So stage one is about how you turn people from the world to get them to your website in the first instance. Stage two is about getting the people who visited your website to become inquirers, so to give you their email address. Strangely enough, in stage two, there's quite a lot about email pop-ups, um, <laughs> weirdly enough. Um, stage three is then about getting that first purchase, and then it goes through about, about really you know, building customer relationships after that. And this model is is all about or the way the book set out is it's all about helping you understand in in chapter nine, which of those stages is where you're weakest at. So you can go and focus your effort there. And then each chapter gives you lots and lots of ideas of how you could then go about improving things. So it might be things to change on your website, things to change with your marketing, extra research you need to do, product tweaks that you can make, or it might be customer service tweaks. So it covers kind of the whole range of interactions to work out how best to get a customer from one relationship level to another. Which I find fascinating because it breaks it in very um, consumable because it breaks it down into each stage. Like, okay, what am I doing at this stage? What am I doing? You know, so that you can pinpoint because it can be very overwhelming to get from somebody doesn't know about you to getting them to be a raving fan. Right. And that that's too big of a problem. It, it's way too big of a problem. It's also something which, which I find um, I, I go to a lot of conferences. I, I chair conferences. I speak at conferences. I chat with the delegates. And what I what I hear people people going is, oh, great. There's a there's a session on social media. I need to do more social media. And I'm like, well, do you need to do more social media? Well, yeah, everyone says I should be doing social media. And I'm like, OK, well, great. But but why should you be doing social media? And at that point, people tend to go, oh, um, 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 and, you know, you can see their brain worrying and they're trying to work out why they need to do social media. And, and people are still kind of approaching their marketing and their activity from a, oh, everyone else is doing that. I need to do it. Or that looks really interesting. I need to need to put that in my business rather than going what I need is more inquirers turning into first time buyers. How do I achieve that? If that if part of that that answer is social media, which bit of social media is that? And it would probably be some kind of CRM remarketing on the Facebook platform, most likely. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be about sending out lots of tweet tweets into the into the Twitter sphere and hoping something comes back. So it's it's the way it's broken down is to, to hopefully encourage people to start thinking about what their problem is and what the right solution is. Be that email, social media getting on the phone, customer services, web chat, you know, whatever it may be. There's many, many options. But if you can start thinking about what you're trying to, to do with your relationship with the customer, you can start to find the right solution. Mm -hmm. And I, I see a lot of business owners, for lack of a better term, twirling in the first stage of just getting people to go to their website. Like that's where all their energy is focused, but they're not focused on how to move people along. What, what, what how would you um, work with somebody who you identified like this is what they're doing? All of their efforts are going towards just getting people to the website and they're not doing much of anything else. Uh, well, I, first of all, I'd have a, an, an inner sigh. I think, oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but then in a, in a more positive frame of mind, um, I think there's this kind of a couple of things you want to do first of all. The first is to work out, you know, what is the end goal? Are we looking for leads in the B2B sense of the world or are we looking for, for actually getting the, the money off people? Um, and then how can we best achieve that? What, what things are meaning we're not getting the conversion rate from those visitors that we should be? So, but then I'd also kind of look on the other side of it. What, what are you doing in terms of traffic driving and how worthwhile is any of that? So, you know, if you're doing Google AdWords and social media and you're doing a lot of guest posting or you've got some big advertising activity on the go, it's like, well, actually, 
how much effort and money are you putting into each of those versus how much traffic you're getting and how well that traffic is then converting on your website. Because then you can quite quickly see where the time is being wasted. And often in those scenarios, you know, when someone's just hell for leather going after their traffic at the cost of the rest of their business, then usually the, the problem, the real problem is that they're not converting enough of that traffic into something else. You know, people are just coming to the website, having a look around, going, oh, that's interesting, and leaving. They're not yeah. buying and they're not signing up. So that generally means that when you do the analysis of where the traffic's coming from, what you find is that none of it's useful because none of it's converting. So then you have to kind of go, oh, okay, great, we're going to have to fix what's happening after the visit before we can go back and properly analyze the traffic sources. And usually the first stage in that is getting a much better email sign up in place. Um, and the, the kind of the go-to at the moment is putting a pop-up in place. So yeah. um, on my site, uh, which are stats I'm allowed to share, uh, we, we were getting about half a percent of everybody who came to the website signing up. And then I put a terrible pop-up live because I built it in about 10 minutes. I bought the software, as we all do, I bought the software about a month before and still hadn't got around to installing it on my site or building a pop-up. I was like, come on, Chloe, you've got to do this. This shouldn't take you this long. Let's just get it up and we'll worry about what it looks like and how good it is later. Did that and um, and, and conversion rate went up to 5% of all people who come to the website. So that's what with the bad pop-up. With the bad, with the bad, <laughs> badly designed, badly put well, it, obviously the technology was working, but the wording wasn't right, the colours right, weren't right. right. And it's just gone just throw it up there and see what happens. You know, and I got that, that to five percent. Mm -hmm. And then I've had people on my my podcast in the e-commerce space who've tweaked and tweaked and tweaked and refined where the pop-up happens, what the pop-up looks like, what the offer is. And you've got to an eight percent of all traffic to their website signs up. And that's huge. You know, you could, because the reason it's so huge is because you've got those person's details. They've trusted you with something. So you can now prove to them that you're trustworthy and you can start building a relationship with them by sending them out the right information at the right time for their journey. So it's, and it's an awful lot, quick, lot easier to get an email sign up out of somebody than it is to get cold, hard cash out of them to buy a product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, every every stage that you took people through, what I could clearly identify was it was all about making the person feel more comfortable, more at home, feeling like they belonged, you know, that they could trust you. And, and that 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 was a lot of relationship building along the way. Oh, yeah. What and what would how would you describe um, because like, you know, we say relationship building and, and a lot of people think one thing, but what are some of the um, techniques and strategies you help your own clients implement to build relationships with their clients or their customers so that they they move through these stages um, pretty smoothly? Oh, wow. That's a big question. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that, that we can break it down. Yeah, so yeah. Maybe. Maybe since we've talked about visitor to inquirer, you know, what's the relationship building piece that goes, you know, taking from somebody from an inquirer to that big jump that first time by? Yeah, that's, that's a really, really good point. Um, the first thing you've got to do is is to to deliver on whatever promise you made them. So when someone gives you their email address, it's a transaction of some type. I know it's not a financial transaction, but it's definitely a transaction. They are giving you something in return for something. And they're also trusting you to treat their email fairly. So the first thing you've got to do is to very quickly deliver whatever it is you promised them. If you promise them 10% off, give them 10% off. If you promise them a free gift, give them the free gift. If you promise them high quality, interesting content, give them high quality, interesting content. So you want to get a welcome email out to them the second they sign up that says, hey, welcome. Here's what we promised we'd give you and probably you also at this point want to go into some more information about your business to help really t showing them behind the scenes, telling them the story, helping them create that emotional connection with your business. The other really important thing is they've trusted you with their email address. They're testing your, you out. They're seeing if you're a decent business to do, to do uh, business with. So you want to make sure that you're treating their email with respect. You're not giving it to anyone else. You're not sending them 20 emails in the next five minutes that you're giving them great quality content. So then they're going to feel warmer and warmer with your business to the point where they're going to be ready to buy. So that's not just about send, purely sending them content. You know, here's, here's some information about our founder. Here's some information about the team. Here's how we go about sourcing products. It's also about sending them some sales messages. 
you know, but you need to pick the right sales messages. So, for example, humans like to buy what other humans like to buy because it's reassuring. Well, if everybody else has bought it, it must be good. So you want to make sure you're sending out a here's our best selling products email or a top reviewed products email if you've got uh, lots of reviews on your products. Because then people are going, oh, wow, OK, everybody else likes this. This is a really safe choice. This is this is something which other people have liked, other people have bought, and therefore it's going to be an easy, safe purchase for me to make, which then gets that customer to to make their first purchase with you, which is the first step mm-hmm. on their journey to, to bringing you a lot of profit. Yeah. So the first step was like, it was like one of those like very simple, just do this. Like if you promise something, <sighs> deliver it. Yeah. You know, can automatically start building up trust and then also giving people information and in, into your background, who you are, the company, the founders and all of that. And, you know, building up that social proof can help, you know, create those first time buyers. And I know just within my own business, I don't have shopping carts on my website, but I do have people opting into my email list. There's different opt-ins I have on my website, depending on where you land and where you go. Um, There's little goodies everywhere for for people to find. And I also have people who've opted into the Facebook group. And I think you're absolutely right, is that, you know, when people have, you know, reached out to me to say, I'm ready for coaching, can we talk? You know, I think you're my client is when, you know, they, they, I've delivered like on the podcast, I do, I have an episode that goes out every Sunday and Wednesday, every Sunday and Wednesday, like I say, I'm going to do it, I do it. And then I also talk about the kind of clients I work with the results they get other people start talking about it. And then before you know it, somebody says, we need to talk, I'm I'm your client. Like you're the person I want to work with and boom, you know, the first time buyer happens. Oh, completely. It's just about being honest and and putting yourself out there so people can get a handle on what you're doing. And and actually one of the the biggest with this particular link from inquirer to first time buyer, what I find an awful lot of people struggling with is they think that, oh, welcome sequence. Oh, well, I haven't got time to create 10 emails. It's oh, you don't need 10. Start with one. (laughs) And then when you get when you get a chance to make a second one add a second one it's like you yeah. it's you, you can do it in bite-sized pieces you know create one email that reacts to your sign up and then you know other some people will have been thinking oh my god jody has got different things in different parts of the website which is an awesome place to get to but you don't need multiple sign ups and it took years yeah exactly <laughs> right. you know it's like you don't need you only need one you know just right. put put up a pop-up that says sign up for news of our latest offers and great tips and tricks if you can provide that, obviously. And you'll be surprised at how much you get back just simply from that. You don't have to give money away. You don't necessarily have to give um, give a PDF download or a checklist or something away. There are There's lots of different things you, you can test. And, you know, I go into a lot of detail about the different options in the book. And that's the pitfall I've run into as well, Chloe. And and I can still follow into it where I see a business, right? You have that person or business you aspire to and you see everything that they're doing and you're trying to create it, but you're not creating it in stages. That makes sense. So yeah. then you end up with this like, you know, it, you know, to use the analogy of like a car, this rickety car, right? That has has like three wheels, you know, the brakes may work sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. just just because everything because you tried to build the whole car all at once, you know, and yeah. so you didn't put all the pieces in place. So go ahead. Yeah. Or, or it's um to take your analogy kind of another level. You've got this rickety car, but it's got the most amazing engine glistening in there, but it's not going to go anywhere because you didn't pay attention to the wheels. You know, right. <laughs> it's kind of like yes. people just go, oh yeah, I need to do everything. And then I'm going to focus on this one thing and do it to death and make make the perfect welcome sequence. I'm only getting one email sign up a month, but I've got a 20, 20 email sequence that flies off when that one person signs up. It's like, right, okay, you should have stopped at two welcome emails and got and done some work on traffic, maybe. Right. It's, um, yeah. Yeah. It's it's a good it's a good way of thinking about the model, and I love that that you kind of, you talk about that in chapter nine to help people identify okay which parts of the car did you overlook yeah. that you could go back and build and get in place so that the whole system you know the whole car works together to get you where you want to go. Well, it's it's about working out which bit is the weakest in your business, 
making it up to standard with the others, not making it perfect because in this world, nothing is ever perfect. Um, you can always improve things, but you, you know, you take it up to that level. So it's on parity with the rest. Then you work out which is now the next lowest level. And simply by bringing a stage up to parity, up to the point where it's equal to the others, something else will then appear as a whole, you know, because if you've, if you, if everything in your business is great, apart from getting, um, turning first time buyers into repeat buyers and you improve that, then you're probably going to then go, okay, well, that bit's working, but now now I need more inquirers because my funnel's working. So I need mm-hmm. I need more traffic and more visitors and all the rest of it. And then you may also at that point go, oh, well, I didn't have a regular buyer's problem before because, well, I didn't have any repeat buyers, but now I've got repeat buyers. Oh, my God, I'm now going to have to go and look after the regular buyers. <laughs> so- <laughs> I'm going to have to hire somebody yeah. and da 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 in the next stage, in the next stage. But it's all it's all growth. It is, and, it, and- it's the way it should be. You know, you're, if, you, if you make one part of your business huge, then, you know, or perfect, then it means you've neglected other areas and you're not going to be growing as fast as you could. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, Chloe, let me turn the tables on you a little bit because there's a couple of questions. One, I've been asking all my guests lately and another question I'm going to be adding to my regular lineup. So the first one is, I'm always curious, what's a current challenge that you're faced with in your business now that we've talked about all the like where you focus on as different parts are growing. Okay, my my current challenge, I'm going to be extraordinarily um, honest here, is I've just spent a huge amount of time and effort and energy um, publishing and promoting my book. And I've kind of let everything else in the business slide. So um, so I'm current, currently on a little bit of a sales push. Um, I'm doing a lot of chasing up and I'm, I'm also looking to build... Um, I've, I've got quite a good, quite a good stage one, quite a good stage two. Stage three is okay, but I've, I've really got nothing going on in stage four at the moment. So I'm, I'm about to be building my own little stage four plan to get those repeat buyers happening in the business. There you go. There's some brutal honesty for you. No, I love it. And you know, it's perfect because you're uh, a second time, you know, this is your second time. So anyone who goes back and listens to episode 45, you'll hear from Chloe's answers that she was killing it in sales, like had no problem. Like that was not what she was focusing on. She was looking to get more inquiries and and like let more people know about her. So that's why she started the podcast. And I'm assuming you had started writing the book or had thought about writing the book at that point as well. And so now that you've made that part bigger, now you're focusing on a different area of business, but overall you've up leveled. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. To another stage. Yep. And that's, that's how business works, right? We, we focus, it's, it's like that, uh, that vision of like the spinning plates and you're just running down the line trying to keep all the (laughs) (laughs) plates spinning, but it's so true, but you get better and better at better and more efficient at spinning the plates and you actually start adding plates or making bigger plates. Um, so that's perfect. The other question I wanted to ask you, Chloe, and that I'm starting to add is because, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, people are inquiring, like, how are these women doing all of these things in their, their business? You know, like, cause a lot of women who listen to this podcast, they're kind of doing it on their own, whether it be in their careers, they're working in corporate or they're, they're, um, solopreneurs or micro business owners, but they're doing a majority of the work on their own. And, and what they're, they're trying to glean is like, how did the women who come on your podcast reach that level of success? What's going on? So Chloe, if you could, for, for those listening, um, Tell us about your support system and the, and the people around you that you have in place that help you to support you to get your business to where it is today. Cool. Well, I'm, mine's quite, uh, quite crazy in, in, in complexity, I suppose. Um, I'm, I keep considering having an employee or not having an employee. And I kind of tested having an employee over the last 12 months, but it didn't quite, I wanted someone to look after the selling side of things, which as you can guess from my previous answer, did not go no, through no fault of the other person. It's just everybody wants to speak to me, which is, you know, understandable really. We're talking about white papers I could write or blog posts I could write or training courses I could do or what their problems are in their business. And you can't really outsource that to someone else. Or I certainly I can't yet. So, um, so now we're back to a kind of a, a, a huge number of different freelancers. So I try to take the process of looking at my business and working out what either I dislike doing 
or things that are just a total waste of my time and time sappers. So I have uh, a marvellous chap called Kieran and his colleague Shana, who look after all my podcast production. So I do the recording and then they they edit it and make it into lovely MP3 things, um, which was brilliant. And they're via Music Radio Creative, uh, who I know a lot of people use. Then um, in... I now have have a guy who does the techie stuff on my website when I need techie stuff doing. I can do most of it myself, but it's just a bit of a waste of time. So I now have the lovely Richard Collett who does that for me. Um, I'm going to have to stop naming names because I'm going to forget someone in a minute. So I'll try not to. <laughs> we'll just go to concepts, I think, from here yes, on in. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> then we've got, I've got some outsourced virtual assistants who look after the phone and the contact us emails just to, just to free me up a little bit. I still haven't nailed that and I'm probably going to look at a bigger virtual assistant piece later in the year. Um, the lady who was helping me out with with sales is still doing one day a week with me and she does my show notes for my podcasts and she does my podcast recruitment, which was a massive time sapper. Um, so she does, does a great job of those. Um, who else do I use? I've got a graphic designer who I use on Upwork. Uh, most of my, all my book production was done on Upwork. Um, I've got a social media team who do my social media and I've got a, I've obviously got accountants and bookkeepers cause that's like the first thing you should outsource. Um, and then I've got, uh, the, a fantastic team who've done all the promotion for my book, which, um, they keep wanting me to do things, which is good because otherwise I wouldn't do them. Um, and they do <laughs> great work themselves. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have got, um, uh, customer manipulation to to number one on amazon.com so yeah. so yeah i i'm i'm learning over time where my skill sets lie and the you know the reason i chose to outsource the promotion of this book is because i'd outsourced the promotion of the po- a lot of the podcast promotion last year and that really worked well it made me take the whole project more seriously i'm not sure because i because i put money in the game or because there was someone else on the team but it certainly helped me really push things forward so i did took the same strategy with the book this year Mm, I love that. So clearly you have a team of people around you that support you, but you're still figuring it out, like where your time is best spent, who who's going to do what. Um, and that allows you to have more bandwidth in your business and have a broader reach. Um, and something I read in the book, and I know it was a quote you shared last time. So this one, I'm definitely put you, putting you on the spot, but I loved and how the book was all about keep optimizing. Oh like, yeah. Everything's <laughs> about keep optimizing in my world. Um, yeah. I actually now have, uh, which was my summer project last year. I, I, I indulge in cross stitch in my spare time. I design cross stitch samplers and then make them up. And I've got one at the, on my stairs now every day I walk down the stairs. Um, it's got, uh, got keep optimizing across the top of this picture of lots of other key <laughs> things to remind me about things in my life. So yeah, everything is about optimization. Yeah that mentality of constant improvement. And is there another quote or a mantra that you would like to leave everyone with before we, you know, before you share where they can find you? Oh, wow. That's a big, a big old question. (laughs) Um, Oh, I'm terrible with mantras and things. What have I heard, heard recently? Uh, am I allowed to be really, really weak and just go for keep optimizing again? You, you know, what? I'm going to allow you to go with keep <laughs> optimizing again, because I, I do love that one. I think um, that's key because what I love about keep optimizing, it, it doesn't mean fix everything now. No. It means, you know, identify what's not working and work towards making it better. It's just, it's the, when I think about keep optimizing, it's about the baby steps that are going to take you from where you are right now to where you want to be. And it's a little bit every day. And really, to make things- really, really, really importantly, it's also a recognition that nothing's ever finished and that that's absolutely fine, which is, is kind of an important one for me. A lot of the time is it's all right. It doesn't have, nothing has to be perfect because you're going to improve it all over the next few months. It just needs to be happening. Well, there's a mantra right there. Nothing is ever finished and that's absolutely fine. (laughs) (laughs) You got one out of me in the end. (laughs) I did. I knew I could. (laughs) Well, Chloe, it has been an absolute joy. Please let those who are listening know where they can find you and where they can find your book as well because it's fantastic. Well, you can find me and everything I'm up to at ecommercemasterplan.com. You'll find all the contact details and all the rest of it on there. Best way to get hold of me is usually via Twitter where I'm at Chloe underscore ECM. 
EMP, short for e-commerce master plan. And if you want to know more about the book, which is called Customer Manipulation, you can find it on all the Amazon platforms as paperback, Kindle and uh, audiobook. I'm pretty certain it's also on iTunes as an audiobook. And you can also, if you've, you know, if you've lost track of all of that and you want it really simple, just go to customermanipulation.com. Awesome. Chloe, thank you again for the second time for taking the time to inspire and enlighten us. We are all better for having met you. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure to be on. Thank you for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. Are you ready to take the lead in your own life but need some support? Head over to womentakingthelead.com forward slash contact to introduce yourself. And to strengthen you on your leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining with me and here's to your success.